we drive the slides and. Uh... Yeah, so Sergey is going to talk about the release testing process uh, for 2101, which should be out in a couple of weeks. Um, all right, go for it. All right, sharing my screen. Okay, so here we go. Uh, so this is our semi-formal report. Uh, the team was Asunta, David, John, Keith, and myself. So first of all, um, release testing is hard and uh, the team makes all the difference and every single one uh, was absolutely invaluable, uh, every team member. So thank you very much. Uh, the work became bearable, doable, and we did it. So moving on, uh, we tried to plan uh, our release testing based on the results of uh, 2009 testing. The results were not very quantitative, mostly qualitative, but this is, at least this is what we based our plan on. So first of all, the key results were uh, in the past cycle, we did uh, 21 uh, tutorials. Uh, we used them as testing, as, as, as usage scenarios. Uh, we did the tool test result comparison uh, where we compared the, uh, the tests of, uh, of, of tools uh, compared to previous runs, uh, tests on the new release compared to the previous runs. Uh, we did only three, and that's an approximate number, only three out of the 300, exactly 350 release notes items for the previous release. And we spent on it approximately two weeks of time. So that was a major commitment. And, uh, I dare say we didn't get even close to what we anticipated we would be able to do. Uh, there were several recommendations based on that release cycle, testing release cycle. Uh, the two, uh, the three most important, which were re re relevant to the release testing process, were one, a more structured testing plan uh, based on some kind of protocol of what to do and what not to do, what to test, when to open an issue, when not to open an issue. Uh, two was to open issues more aggressively. So what we did in the previous testing cycle is we would find an issue, we would spend a lot of time identifying whether it was an issue or not. Uh, maybe we would post an issue, maybe, maybe we would jump into uh, fixing the bug and that could take an hour or two or three or four days. Uh, so that was uh, an item for improvement. And we also made uh, a recommendation to mix and match testing teams uh, so that there are both developers and active Galaxy users. Uh, this is the only item we were not able to implement this time around. So release testing plan. This is the specific plan we put together and which we tried to follow religiously. So first of all, the scope. Uh, GTN tutorial, tutorials, again, they, uh, they provide, they prove to be a very good idea. They are uh, well-defined tried and tested scenarios for Galaxy usage. So what we did, uh, we decided to go through a select tutorials in GTN, uh, of course, noting any required updates and uh, opening issues where necessary, but uh, noting anything that reflected any changes uh, which stemmed from the new release. Uh, second, uh, release notes. Again, in the absence of a formally set in stone defined set of requirements, uh, release notes, we decided to use them as a semi-formal itemized list of uh, new things, new items that are supposed to work. So we went over the release notes. Uh, we plan to go over the release notes uh, as time permits, verifying each item. Uh, and we did not do tool test results because luckily they were completed before the testing process started. So the approach, um, and these are the specific differences uh, compared to the previous testing cycle. One, we had a very specific, well, a much more specific testing protocol. We had defined what, when to open an issue, as in uh, when we did tutorials, we mapped out specific requirements, what constitutes an issue. So for example, incorrect or outdated descriptions of steps that conflict with the current UI, with updated UI or updated screenshots, again, that conflict with the steps um, presented in the tutorial, broken links to internal Galaxy locations. We also out outlined items which do not require opening an issue. Again, they, that, would be a good, that would be a good thing to open an issue, but it's impossible to do everything within the scope of uh, release testing. 
uh, we also said uh, we also specified how to or at least knows how to verify that a problem is relevant how to verify that it is indeed a problem caused by the new release and what would be the steps for opening an issue if such an issue is not already open how you tag it uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so we had this structure on our hands which helped us move through uh, move through the release testing process the second uh, very important change is uh, we did not fix bugs. We decided to focus specifically on what the release testing team is supposed to do, as in test, uh, identify, uh, identify bugs, identify issues, and uh, let the team uh, fix them, as really it is supposed to be. The time commitment, we planned two full days. I dare say it was not two full days in the end. It was probably more like one week. Uh, but again, that was that was the plan. And moving on to result summary. Thanks, Sergey. <clears throat> I'm gonna take you guys through the, the results of what we did. So we went through 24 tutorials, um, 30 release note items, opened 26 issues, and nine of those issues are blocking issues. The tutorials that we covered of the 24, four of them um, were admin tutorials. Five of them were introduction tutorials and 15 of them are Galaxy interface tutorials. So a pretty good spread. And then these are um, of the 30 release note items that we covered. Three of them were considered enhancements. Two of them built in tool updates. Um, nine of them were new data types, two new visualizations and 14 highlights. Uh, the issues that we opened, we opened up 26 issues. Um, nine of them were in the training material repo and 17 of them you could find in just the Galaxy repo. And like I said earlier, nine of them are considered blocking issues. Um, and that's, that's what we found. Uh, Keith, are you there? Yes, I am here now. Uh, sorry, I was a few <laughs> minutes late to the meeting. Um, uh, here's just a couple of uh, examples of the, the problems we had identified. Um, as Asante pointed out, you know, we'd found 26 issues. This is just um, some examples in the UI. Uh, 11443 uh, data set headers are not being um, displayed. Uh, there's a problem with uh, text wrapping can break uh, words incorrectly in the UI. Um, so that will be uh, a CSS issue, most likely. Um, some controller routes uh, fail um, when you reload. Um, I think that was a, a known issue. Um, in the server errors, there's the root problem with the rule builder 11437 uh, on occasion would return an empty list. Um, sometimes 11451, there's unhandled errors when creating tags. Uh, most of the tutorials were okay. There's a few outdated screenshots um, and some outdated or inconsistent steps. Most of those uh, fall into what Sergey said, you know, things that we decided that we weren't, uh, weren't important enough to actually um, open issues for. And then there's uh, uh, some other common ones. Um, the last point there, uh, 11504, the clear search button doesn't always clear the text. Uh, 11465, data, data libraries, uh, some, uh, the search triggered a refresh. And then there was an issue 11503 uh, about workflow best practices that has already been uh, addressed and closed. Uh, so if people want to go in, they can just do a, a quick look at those. So moving on to blocking issues. Um, so I, I'll, I'll talk about this slide, but one thing I wanted to mention um, that these 26 issues, um, you know, like listening to the talk, I'm, I'm realizing that uh, uh, you can, uh, whatever slide, um, that the, the 26 issues are after we did, after the whole team and the extended community spent a week on the uh, smorgasbord, like right? a week getting ready for it and a week doing it. I mean. I know that many people spent more than a week um, getting ready for it, but I mean, in terms of like, you know, Anton yelling at the core team, like, let's get this done. Like, um, like so we, we, there was a lot of hands on all of those tutorials and, and this release had a tremendous amount of testing already. 
And then the release team took over and still found 26 issues. And I think that's really a testament to like the thoroughness of the team. And I'm just uh, nothing but respect and, and, and appreciate Sergey's effort and, and everyone. Um, there are still nine blocking issues. I, I'm not sure that all of these were discovered as part of the release testing process, but some of them were. Um, so I, I know that I'm, I'm trying to sort of tackle the rule builder ones here. There's two of those that are open. Um, I think that uh, Marius has taken care of most of the century issues, but I think there's still one there. But if anyone else has time to sort of jump in and, and take one of these on, um, that would be great. Um, so I, I think I went through and I pruned, uh, you know, this, this list was, uh, had like 40 items on it at the beginning of the day, but I, I pruned a bunch down. And I think these are the ones that are sort of blocking the release. They seem like regressions. Um, and, and if they're not regressions, just go in there and say this was broken in the last release and need to push it off. Uh, but yeah, so that's the that's the blocking issues. Okay, moving on. Uh, so that gets us to testing process analysis. Uh, it's a, not a formal analysis, but a semi-structured way of uh, summarizing what we what we what the, the conclusions we came up with after we looked back at the process. So first of all, we made it better. I I think so. I hope so. Uh, and these are the main points uh, compared to the previous release testing cycle. So first of all, it is much, much easier um, to do it when the protocol is detailed. I'm the only one on the team who did the previous uh, testing cycle. So this is based on my opinion only, but the opinion is strong. I believe this really made a significant difference. So these uh, steps which we outline, look at the issue. If the issue does not exist, uh, open an issue, tag it with this label, tag it with this milestone, et cetera, et cetera. It actually helps. When you look at the items which uh, constitute uh, an issue that should be raised on uh, the training network repo, it actually helps. When you see that, aha, uh -huh, this can be ignored, you immediately forget about it, move on to the next uh, to the next tutorial or to the next batch of release notes to look for stuff to, do, to, to detect. So that helps. Second, uh, that is significant. We actually did release notes. Uh, last time we completely ran out of time. There were 350 uh, release notes items in 2009. Uh, we covered three, but I dare say we covered none because those were kind of important items in addition to release notes. This time around, we actually covered 30 items of the release notes. Uh, of course, we prioritized, so uh, we did not cover them randomly. We focused completely on the items which are listed above the release notes proper. So highlights, um, there were no security notices, there were no deprecation notices, but those are the kind of items which we would include, we would suggest including normally on any release testing cycles. So these 30 items from the release notes are legitimate items which were looked examined to a certain extent and uh, gave a yay or nay. Three, availability, availability of VMs, very helpful. We had virtual machines, we, we underutilized them, uh, but they were available. And uh, first of all, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, uh, he set them up. Uh, I can't even uh, guess how much time uh, that required. Uh, and effort and sweat and pain. Uh, so thank you. And I'm sure we uh, groups should utilize VMs more next time, both for GAT testing and also for comparative release, release testing, when you need to verify whether or not an item is indeed a problem on the new release, but not on the previous release. So that was great. Um, and uh, probably the most important boost to our productivity was the fact that we focused on testing and not testing and fixing. Uh, thank you, Marius, for suggesting that at the very beginning of the, of the, of the testing cycle. Uh, this made a huge difference. Again, I remember last release cycle, we would discover an item and possibly we would spend hours, if not days, on trying to figure out how to fix it. And that, in, in, uh, that involved learning about this or that part of Galaxy for some of us on the team. Uh, this time we would identify an item, we would immediately move on to looking for more. And that helped us identify, cover 30 items from the release notes. So that was great. And moving hey, on. Sergey, hey, yes. Sergey, for the VMs, is that in Jetstream or in a commercial cloud? Jetstream, uh, Keith, Jetstream, right? 
you are muted. Sorry, yes, those were on uh, Jetstream. I just uh, spun up one instance on a, a cluster on Google um, just to do some last minute uh, testing with the Anvil stuff. But Great, that wasn't that formally included in part of our uh, release testing plan. Great, that was my next question about, um, I mean, presumably if it, wor it works in Jetstream, that gives us a huge leg up for working in other cloud environments, including Anvil or for ITCR. I guess, you know, at this point, you know, that, that may be beyond the scope of what we can do comprehensively now, but I think moving forward, that needs to be part of the test plan. Those are just yeah, super and I think we've sort of talked about that uh, a little bit, that the next time around, we would have uh, VMs on all the, the cloud providers that we can have on uh, Jetstream, Google, I don't know if we want to do Amazon or something like that, but have those uh, available just as a, a sanity test to make sure that they work. And then some of these things require admin access. So they need to go in and actually run Ansible playbooks and they can't really be doing that on main or EU. Yeah, yeah. great, great, thank you. Moving on. Okay, I guess this is my slide. Thank you, Sergey. As uh, John had mentioned, um, you know, the week before people had been doing uh, a lot of tests uh, for the smorgasbord. So when we ran through any of the tutorials, or at least when I ran through the tutorials, particularly the admin training stuff, um, there were no major problems um, uh, found in the tutorials themselves. Um, as for working through the release notes, we did identify a, a couple of issues. And one of them is simply the number of items uh, in the release notes. Um, there was, uh, I think it says there 350 in 20.09 down to 283 in 21.01. Um, there's no way a team our size, given the, the amount of time we had, could uh, make it through that, even if we did find a, a way to do it um, efficiently. Um, and it's sort of, you get the sense that you're trying to empty the ocean with a teaspoon. You can try and whittle away a few of these issues and the list of outstanding issues doesn't really um, get any smaller. So um, you didn't really have a, a sense of uh, making progress. Like the first number of issues, there is um, you know, a dozen or so and we're able to knock those down and you see them getting smaller and you feel like you're having something, then you get into the uh, release notes and you're just sort of swimming and treading water without any uh, noticeable progress. Because one of the problems we had is it was not always obvious to us how to prioritize which one of these tests. Um, some were highlighted as being important, uh, but for the rest of them, it was really hard work for us to figure out uh, what were the, um, the most important ones that we should be dedicating our effort to. And then when we did identify them, it wasn't always clear um, how we should go about testing that release note. Um, rather than saying, oh, you know, click this, go do this, make sure this output appears, we'd have to go read PRs. Very often uh, the release note would reference uh, two to four PRs. Um, so we spent a lot of time just figuring out what needs to be tested and how we would um, go about doing that testing. Once we did figure out that out, there'd be a lot of duplication, um, things that could, could be or should be done by the automated testing. And then not all of the tests should be testable on main. They might require admin access or they might require um, uh, tools that are not there. And as the last item, uh, some items shouldn't be manually tested. So we need to identify, uh, if we've got a limited amount of resources in human hours, we need to identify what actually requires a human intervention and what can just be um, done automated or uh, automatically. The task can be automated. Okay, and then some uh, ideas that we had uh, for improvement. Asanta came up with the idea of uh, a PR template. I believe it was Asanta. I hope I'm not uh, giving, uh, uh, missing somebody for the credit, uh, but have just a, a common template for PRs. Um, people can go look at that pull request. It seems to, I think it's actually already been um, accepted. Um, 
that just include some ideas or uh, some details on what the PR does and how to test it. And ideally, at least some screenshots um, from the pe person submitting the PR, ideally maybe even a little animated GIF to show uh, how to recreate the problem or how to test it. Um, PRs uh, could be tagged uh, for items that need special attention back to the uh, previous slide where we uh, want to identify tests that require some human intervention. So maybe we could have some uh, tags in there that says, oh, a human needs to um, identify this. Uh, the use of the Galaxy admin tutorials uh, was a great idea. Um, and then we also talked about maybe a greater uh, focus on um, automating testing, uh, perhaps using, uh, creating uh, some Selenium tests that basically uh, mimic some of the tutorials going through and stepping through those, that those could just be automatically kicked off um, as part of the release test. Um, <clears throat> There's a comment in there about uh, Sentry. Somebody else will have to talk about to Sentry. I'm not that familiar with it. Um, and then the idea of, uh, again, having a side-by-side -side test where we've got uh, running through something on main and on a, a VM, uh, potentially with a, a previous version so we can easily compare uh, what was going on in a previous version as compared to what is going on in the uh, release version under test. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so all of these items are open now for discussion. But before we jump into discussion, I just want to uh, say two things. One, first of all, the, the PR template merged, uh, which has merged already. I encourage everyone to take a look. It is a it is fantastic. I think uh, it, it should improve uh, release testing, at least besides many other things, significantly. And there is a very detailed discussion in that PR so essentially it's a work in progress, which we have merged so far, and we will try to improve it as we go. Secondly, uh, GitGat, uh, Helena agreed to uh, briefly introduce this. We think this is going to be very, very useful to incorporate it in uh, the following, the subsequent release testing cycle. So Helena, if you could uh, speak. Sure, uh, tell absolutely. Us about it. Thank you. So the admin training previously we've had some issues keeping like the playbooks as they actually are constructed and the tutorials in sync a bit because the tutorials get updated every year we add new features we add new steps we sometimes add new tutorials and we need to keep the playbooks updated that we want to show as demonstrators so this year we have replaced the playbooks or sorry replaced in the tutorials every change that gets made with a diff and I wrote some scripting to pull out all of these diffs, stack them up into a git history, and or pull them out as patches and apply them to an empty git repository. And then we get out this repository we're calling git gat because it really rolls off the tongue. And this gives a snapshot of the training materials for the admin at every single step. And this should be absolutely invaluable for testing because then we can just go backwards and forwards in time. One of the biggest problems for me testing admin training when we get ready for GAT is that if we need to make a change in the role, we sometimes that change affects every single downstream step. So we have to go back to where that change starts to get applied and then start replaying the playbooks from there on a fresh VM, which is really painful. So with this, hopefully we can say, okay, we've got all of our Git history, and we can just check out some specific positions where we run the playbook and run the playbook there or up to there. Yeah, I um, think that's going to be great. And let me know how we can help and what synergy we can get going here. Because for the next GAT, I really would love to have, OK, not the GCC GAT, but the next proper GAT, I'd really love to see we're running molecule tests to run these playbooks against an empty VM. We're making sure the Galaxy gets set up, that the playbooks don't fail, and maybe running some Selenium tests if they're available of some sort to make sure that the features that are getting deployed are actually enabled and working. Great. Thank you, Helena. Um, I'm sure we can utilize it, and then we can actually help each other. <laughs> 
so uh, all of these items are open up for discussion. So what do you, what do you guys think? Which tutorials do you want to automate with Selenium? Was that the admin tutorials or the user facing? Um, the science tutorials. Both. All of okay. Them. For the Personally, user facing think... ones, it might make sense to use the workflow testing. Yeah, I, I would think that the uh, the the ones. So I, I know that the slides said that everything went well in the, the the tutorials. I mean, I actually encountered quite a few doing the advanced workflow tutorial. Um, like there were three sections, and I think we I, I hit issues on two of them, and it was great to hit them and get that all resolved. And I appreciate everyone who helped, because um, yeah, it was a it was a big community effort to to do that. Um, but I I think all of the little user face element tutorials. Um, if they had this, yeah, where the workflow, where or having the workflow tests isn't quite good enough, right? Because you want those, these are like, uh, these are like screenshot driven things where you're really showing like how to use actual interface components. I would think all of those would be really good candidates for having screenshot tests. And I know Oldleg is doing some work in this realm, trying to get the rule-based uploader tests to automatically generate screenshots for the training materials. And I think that if we could just extend that to the workflow um, UI component, uh, workflow UI training, and maybe like history and search and stuff, I think that would be really fantastic. Definitely, I would definitely support that. Um, yeah, there's definitely three categories: sort of the science tutorials, which can be tested with workflows, the interface tutorials, which need Selenium, and the GAT or the admin tutorials, which need special things and Selenium. But yeah, yeah, that's a good point. We should definitely get all of the UI tutorials under Selenium tests if possible. I would love to use the uh, what Oleg is building currently for all of the UI tutorials. That would be really a bonus for us. Yeah, so I guess this is this call is good. I mean, I guess there are some PIs on the call. It would be nice if the admin and testing groups could take on, you know, automating the testing of GitGat as maybe a quarter two or quarter three task. Um, and then, yeah, just continuing to support Oleg's work and sort of uh, whatever we need to do there to help with that and, and expand the scope of that. But those are, those are great projects. So that should continue to make the roadmap, I think. It's, it's kind of definitely. My, my Speaking point. on behalf of the admin community, definitely we can add that to the Q Q2, Q3. Um, I also wanted to say, I mean, it's something that you mentioned in the pull request that added the pull request uh, template. Um, but I think the tags for things that should go in the release notes would also be really good. Um, so that makes it much easier to write the release notes. Um, and it makes it also clearer what needs to be tested. Because I, I don't think we need to test uh, everything, all 350 items, that's of course uh, not possible and also not useful because a lot of them are just internal changes that have zero impact on anyone. Um, maybe fix some bugs, move some code around, but all this is irrelevant to test. But the things that we should test, tags, I think that's a, that's a great idea. I can, as a data point, it works well in the training materials. We have highlight and new contributor and improvement or new feature, and these work well for pulling out things we want to talk about. I, I mean, we have, have, right? We have enhancement, but like we need to decide bug refactoring enhancement, but there's, I mean, still most of that is not interesting. Uh, there are certain things that, you know, either they should be in the user facing release notes or that's going to have an impact on admins or that might need updating of the admin-centric tutorials and things like that. Um, I so would not have I think we need some additional for questions. that purpose. There's some feedback, so I'm not really hearing. Sorry, I said I would not have known to use enhancement for that purpose. So yeah, maybe we should standardize some tags. Yeah, I think the, there's another one, just a feature, kind feature more than enhancement because tag enhancement, uh, all the ones that are not bug fixes, I think. Mm. And um, just to uh, reinforce the point, uh, and I think that would uh, probably be useful for the testing team to coordinate with uh, whoever is writing the user-related uh, uh, release notes. 
the user uh, was the correct uh, definition. It was uh, user facing. User facing. Thanks, because I think more than the three hundred uh, uh, things that we put in the global release notes. There's the more the user facing ones that need to be tested by by the team. Yeah, that's my yeah. my suggestion. So I mean, I up to this release, I usually started. Um, I mean, Helena wrote the user facing stuff, and I pulled out all the remaining things. So I, uh, I stepped up there a little bit this release. Um, but yeah, I mean, we should like when we branch, we should already do this, and not some weeks later, because. But it wasn't really clear whether the testing is going to happen or not this release. Um, but next release, we can plan this better. I, I, I looked at the participants. I don't think Jen is on the call, but I, I know that in the past she's used other repositories with tags to mark like, this is an issue that she encountered on main and she needs to recheck it or note to herself to recheck it once you know the new release is deployed. So yeah, the tagging thing I really like, I mean, let, I mean, I haven't really thought through it in terms of the release notes. I mean, other than I, we already do sort of organize the initial batch by like priority and stuff. Um, but it would be it would be nice to know like, oh well, if this has a tag that says recheck on main, uh, recheck on EU, um, it would be nice if the QA team, the release testing team could do that. Um, it'd be nice to sort of track that and have a process in place for that. It'll probably help Jen a lot. Um, yeah, so I did want to give a, sh a you know, um, it, it, it would require some buy-in from the com committers to start, you know, using tags more aggressively for describing how things should be tested by the QA team. But I, I really think that's a good idea. Should we maybe have designated testing-related tags, like maybe have test underscore something prepended, so that we don't have to go hunting for the appropriate label, and also keep them to a minimum and not not. Uh, um, treat them as exhaustive, covering all possible cases, but use them only when really necessary. Yeah, I think that would be good. And I, I, I might even use QA as the prefix and said, because there's already some test tags in there, but just sort of how can we improve the whole overall QA process this way? Um, and, I, and again, to clarify, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's, it's doable and a very good idea. And I'm not pushing back on the idea of tagging. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure we, 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 we keep it manageable and don't end up in a situation when we have uh, so many tags, uh, so many uh, PRs tagged, and then we add another tag to the mix. And since that set of tags is supposed to be exhausted uh, and mutually exclusive, we have to go back and re-tag appropriately another 200 uh, PRs. That would be very difficult and definitely not accurate. Right. No, I, I, I agree completely. Um, yeah. We, we have to tag everything with uh, kind and area anyway. So one more for like this needs this testing and this needs another kind of testing. I mean, that's that's not too much overhead like compared to actually looking at the PR. That's fine. I mean, the, 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 the default tags could also give it like, like a no QA label. And then if exactly. it decides, instead of QA none, like, oh, this is a QA main or a QA admin or whatever it is, um, then that then there's actually, it's just a pure bonus, I guess. Um, yes. And I, yeah, I think the pull request template there will help too, right? So if there are automated tests, that really reduces the burden on, on, on needing to, to, to write QA. Although, I mean, people did, I mean, David, for instance, I mean, these automated tests, bug. I, I wouldn't say that automated tests prevent having to test it manually because like the rule builder had tests from the beginning, but still there's, I mean, it's not bug free, right? Because there's just right. so many things you can do and the yeah. automated tests are rarely ever fully comprehensive. Let's say, but for a typical PR, not just one of like something out. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry that I picked one of yours, but like I, that came to mind. 
I, I was going to pick on the best practices filter though, which David, have you found the bugs in, right? Like, yeah. So sort of a big, like Marius or Sam or John, like a, a huge sprawling PR that touches 15 things probably still needs manual testing. But I mean, the typical PR is really changing something rather small generally. And so I, I think it's realistic that the tests would, would cover, you know, I think 90% of my PRs, they are like adding a tool feature that has a tool test, right? Okay, QA team does not need to worry about that. Um, but yeah. It's not mutually exclusive. If a PR doesn't have an automated test, it's, it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be tested manually. It just might mean that it's a refactoring or a new feature, which is somewhere uh, which deals with the internal guts of Galaxy, which has nothing to do with user facing stuff, just misses a test. Yeah. Still having the, I guess my, my major point though was having the PR template will hopefully really sort of help drive those QA tags. But yeah, I'll shut up now. Uh, Marius, did you want to talk more about Sentry? Because I thought that was like really awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't prepare anything, but uh, just in general, no um, and I, I guess I shouldn't show it because um, things like emails appear in Sentry. But uh, Sentry is this um, log aggregation system. Um, so you can connect your Galaxy instance to Sentry. And then um, I don't actually know all logs or just logs above a certain uh, log level. So for instance, warning. Uh, appear in Sentry. And so when we make the switch to a new release, uh, you can check out like after a day, uh, are there any new errors and exceptions? And I did find a couple of things. Um, and because they, I mean, so we have a lot of like sort of error-ish or exception-ish um, type of issues uh, in Galaxy. So if you just go to Sentry, if you look at all errors, so you will feel even worse than if you just look at the issues that went into a Galaxy release, because it's a lot. Most of them are fine. It's not really a problem. A lot of it is like files that have been deleted, but somebody's still trying to access them. Um, and so the point is when you make the release, you can look for new things because they will appear new. They have never seen before. So Sentry also groups them so you can see whether it's a new thing or not. Um, and yeah, that's a good thing to do. Uh, when, when you make the release switch, these uh, exceptions and errors can also be linked to issues. Um, so you can say, okay, this issue should close it. And then when it reappears, you see, okay, that didn't actually work. Um, yeah. And you also find like a lot of code that nobody uses or that is almost unused. And you see occasionally like there's one or two errors per year might not be worth fixing, but sometimes you also see, well, whoa, 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 this is like 10,000 uh, errors coming in since yesterday. There's something really wrong. Um, yeah. Recommend it to everyone that runs a Galaxy server, set up Sentry. Are there any other discussion points? Do I have a curiosity if there's time about the, the VM that you use for, for testing, where they is set up to do also, with, with also all the, the tools that you needed for the tutorials or where the tutorial parts run on usegalaxy.org or something. Keith, how, how did you run yours? One sec, let me unmute myself. Um, yeah, that was actually an issue that I did run into now that you mention it. Um, I went to run through one of the tutorials and it wanted a tool um, that wasn't installed on my VM. Uh, basically, to create the uh, Galaxy instances on the VM is I used the uh, Galaxy Ansible playbook. Um, so whatever that set of tools comes um, out of the box with that, that is... Um, That's nothing. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so uh, part of the, the provisioning then could be um, installing any required tools um, for tutorials. So I, I suppose that builds... Ma Marty, oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I wanted to say this kind of builds on, on what Mike uh, had said that I think it'd be 
great for future releases to have more platforms included in the testing. So each team member uh, takes on a different deployment, um, starting with you know, local, use galaxies, uh, Anvil, um, Amazon, whatever. And because a lot of those already have the tools available. So testing like the admin capability could be done on a local machine, but testing the tools and not have to take on the overhead of installing any of those uh, could be done on, on one of the platforms that provide that. And so that would serve a dual purpose. Do what, what is the tool testing? What do you mean? Like, I didn't understand what you mean by testing the tools. I mean, the tutorials, you got to pull up. The oh, tools. okay. I mean, tutorials, I understand. Tools. Didn't quite understand that. I just we test the tools. Right? We install something bare bones on a VM using just a plain Ansible. Um, you will just get the empty tool panel, and so you can't really run many tutorials, right? I mean, because the tutorials will need the reference data; they'll need tools. So we need a more complete deployment. Um, and setting that up one off just for the testing on a throwaway VM seems wasteful. Um, we can mount CBMFS. I think that's fairly standard setup. And there's lots of scripts for installing all of the tools needed for a tutorial. And if that's not easy enough, we can look into making that easier for the testing group. I mean, that's the point. I mean, generally speaking, um, I guess we have some time, depending on if anyone's interested, but uh, you can mount CBMFS on your laptop, right? And this is the easiest way to uh, run tutorials or develop workflows. Um, especially if you also need to look whether there's some errors uh, occurring, some exceptions. So that's really valuable. Um, since this is a developer round table, I don't think it's too crazy to see, uh, to, to make sure that you know how to do this. And it would um, enhance the point being that it would help tremendously if that testing included some of these automated deployments where you, as a user, you're able to you, you know, launch these machines such as Anvil or um, one of the, the cloud deployments because that's where that is set up uh, at the outset. You still have complete control over seeing the logs, but it would make sure that those deployments are in fact tested um, with the new release. I mean, I, I like the idea, but there's also a lot of us that don't have access to Anvil or any of that. I mean, that's fixable. I mean, that's the same way Keith set this up on Jetstream. You can set up machines uh, for others. Yeah, and currently, as I said, there's uh, an Anvil installation running on uh, Google Cloud right now um, that is installed uh, uh, via the Helm charts. And if uh, uh, the admin uh, team has scripts to install a lot of tools for tutorials, um, those could definitely be included in the uh, provisioning system. Um, so you say, oh, I want a, a VM to test this tutorial and, you know, um, and we can provision that for you easily enough. Yeah, but does the Anvil, the Anvil system is going to have the CVMFS, right? So probably just having that set up would be enough, I think, presumably, yeah. right? So. I mean, if you want to test the tutorial um, and the tools are not there, then we can install them on main, I guess. That's what we've done for the smorgasbord, and I think as, as long as there are tutorial that describes how to use these tools, I don't think there's a problem installing them on main. Or, I mean, the number of tutorials you can't run on main is probably not that high, to put it another way. It's gone a lot better, thanks to Smart Squad. Well, just so we're moving into this, you know, kind of heterogeneous environment, for better or worse, the reality is we're in this heterogeneous environment where there's going to be multiple deployments that you know all are going to require some love and attention. <laughs> Here's a question uh, related, uh, but not um, not to what we we're just discussing. How close do you think we are to requiring uh, any new feature or any new bug fix to be accompanied by a, by an automated test? And what would be what would be the 
uh, how low do we need to lower the bar for the ease of writing a test for that to become a reality? Because many, many major repos, uh, many major projects have that requirement. I mean, I would love it, right? We've discussed it many times. Um, but it's complicated because we're, it's a project with a lot of different areas that it can be tested in a lot of different ways and not all tests are good. Uh, you can definitely cripple the development by writing tests that fail, right? Or, Oh, I've stable. written my I've written my share of brittle tests, which make updating very difficult. I'll fix that. I think I mean I, I would argue for good judgment uh, on the part of the reviewer. Like um, maybe we should request more tests when we feel like this might not work or might have side effects uh, that we didn't think about. But I think requiring tests for everything is probably going to be. Uh, slowing down development. I mean, I mean, I would push back on that and say that judgment is going to be applied unevenly, and it's much easier to request tests if there's a formal policy in place. Uh, and I do think it will slow down development. That is the case, um, but that's probably a good thing um, because we sh the things that are getting in should be tested. Um, uh, I had a thought and then I lost it. I, mean, I would argue that uh, adding tests actually saves time for fixing future problems. So even though you think it's slowing things down, you know, the net price is actually much less. Oh, I mean, don't get me wrong. Better even start with a test before you start writing. It's just, you know, some things are difficult to test. Yeah. Oh, that's one thing I was going to suggest is bug reports or issues when opened, if possible, uh, include a test that is, is show, uh, exposes the bug or the, the, the thing that's uh, not functioning properly. And then whoever comes in to ex, uh, work on that bug simply has to write code until that test passes. So uh, an issue comes with a, a failing test and the issue is closed when the test passes. That's exactly what I was going to suggest. I really like the idea of if you found a bug, make a test for it. You know, that's that's a beautiful idea. But I mean, this is not tests. people that open issues are not paid personnel. I mean, people that open issues are people that found hey, this yeah, is not working. He's right, though. If you're addressing an issue, it would be good if that that issue came with a test to prove it. Right. Sure. Um, I, I'm I'm afraid that if you've written a test that exposes a bug, you are that close to fixing the bug because writing the test to expose the bug is usually more difficult than fixing the bug itself. Yeah, but the test is for the future, so. <laughs> what, what, and it what also I depends on the nature of the bug. If it's very trivial, trivial, yes, the bug writing the test might be more work than actually fixing the bug, but you still need to, the test to show that, demonstrate that it's been fixed. I'm I'm completely I completely agree with Keith that uh, fixing a bug must come with an accompanying test. Uh, what I'm saying is that maybe that test should be part of the PR and not part of opening the issue because one, as Mario said, uh, we we don't pay the people who open our issues, and, and and secondly, maybe it's not a dev or an admin who discovered an issue, so they would know wouldn't know the first thing about writing a test. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of circling back to Marius's point about, you know, not requiring tests versus requiring tests, maybe what we could do as a step in the direction that Sergey recommended is that if you're not including a test in a PR, you've got to have an explanation why. So take that pull request template that Asunta put together and push it a little bit further and say, you know, this, this by default, these all PRs require tests. Um, if you don't have a test, explain how to test your PR manually and explain why it doesn't make, you know, wh why it's too onerous to write an automated test for it. I, I think that might be a good step in that direction. I mean, another step in that direction could be that we differentiate between core contributors and external contributors. Adding tests has always the difficulty of 
you raise the bar of entrance, right? And and testing, as you said, is complicated. So you might push back new contributors. But what we could do is actually requiring tests for all committers, for all core contributors. Or what would also be easy enough to do is I think we have these areas which we change like API or front end and so on. And that we require tests for one of these areas specifically that we say every API needs to have a test and so on. Um, because we know writing tests for certain areas is easier than for other areas. Um, but we should take into consideration that as soon as we require tests and whatever level, we raise the bar of entrance. I mean, I like it, it, it goes both ways, right? I think uh, the only thing I'm a little concerned about is uh, making it a hard requirement. Um, otherwise, yeah, encouragement is always good. Um, because you know, the more tests we have, the more examples there are of how to use the thing that you're trying to fix. Maybe we can have a label in bright red color requires a test. And then the core contributors can uh, can find those PRs, open PRs, which just require a test. And if it's a PR by a member of the community, well, help out. Yeah, I mean that that's going to really slow down community contributions still. Um, yeah, I think any hard requirement for tests just has to be for the paid people, the core committers, and um, you know the Galaxy team. I don't think we can be forcing community people if they report require. Uh, you know, if they're reporting an issue that we force them to have a, a test with that, maybe there's some sort of, you know, way we can automatically generate a test that just returns false or throws an exception by default. And then part of whoever does it is, you know, part of the, the fixing the test is writing the test as well. How would we, I, at this point, it's not even clear to me how we would identify those people. Um, like there's so many um like are bjorn's people those people um I and mean, we could start with the committers group right this is automatizable yeah that 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 is a that it's a clear group is, is there any committer here who would object to requiring their prs to have tests i mean as long as we can explain why there are no tests sure right as long as there's like an opt-out. Yes. But if we're going to have an opt-out, we might as well just make an opt-out for everyone. Like we can then just, I think we could just have a universal rule. Like, I mean, an opt-out reason could be I'm this, my first time contributor. I don't know how to write a test for this, right? Like, or like you guys have already tests there, just changing something. I mean, refactorings, right? Things like that, that are small and covered by tests already. Oh yeah, I mean, if it's covered, if it's already covered by tests, then you just check it. This is already covered by existing tests, right? Um, and Nate, the answer is no. <laughs> I think Nate has to write two tests. Yeah. <laughs> Nate, Nate has a backlog of tests he needs to write first before he's allowed to contribute anything else. I think uh, unit tests should be mandatory because there's no yes. setup, setup for writing unit tests. But like integration tests, I can see situations when writing an integration test is not easy. So maybe we could have exceptions for those only. So I, I, a unit test can be not easy in the context of Galaxy uh, because you might be may, you might be fixing some obvious thing which will be part of a 300 line method which is not unit testable unless you refactor it and that's potentially a can of worms. Not that we don't need to address it, but uh, if we are core committers, staff, yes. If we're a community member, maybe that's too high a bar. Yeah, I, yeah, I, think I, I mean, like for instance, uh, Kayvon, your, your PRs 
on the, the tool testing thing, right? That's much easier addressed with an integration test at this point. Having to unit test something in basic.py is, I mean, it's going to be a, a big test. It's going to be a, a worthless test. It's, you know, it's it's all of those pieces to sort of moving together, I think, are 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 useful just because of how it's I mean, it's designed poorly, right? And it's yeah, if you're, if you're poorly 300 years ago and we can't fix it now. But if you're uh, Galaxy, there's no unit testing because you're right, there's no units. But like if if you're writing new code, it should be unit testing, right? Yeah, I mean I, 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 I sort of disagree. I think it depends on the component, right? I mean, if you've got a nice isolated component, like a, a nice isolated unit is fine, but there's some API functionality, the database stuff, it's all quite integrated. And every time I've tried to write uh, unit tests for, I, I mean, I'm getting better, but like tool stuff or job stuff, I just mocked out so much stuff to get to the unit test that I, I mean, I regret ever even writing those tests. Um, and you know, if there's an integration test, I, I don't, yeah. And, and this is why I think the PR template's great because it says an automated test, right? Because sometimes a unit test is more appropriate and sometimes an integration test is more appropriate. Yes, as John said, unit tests are not necessarily easy in Galaxy. Uh, I, I wrote my share of brittle tests where I mocked out this and this and this and that. And, and, and what that leads to is greater test coverage, but uh, we have to change and adjust those tests all the time. And ideally a good unit test should not have to be changed. So there is this decision on how much to mock and, and, and what to mock and how to mock it. And this is something uh, a first time contributor is, is, is not capable of, of doing on their own. I mean, I'm both for not mocking at all because I don't like mocking. <laughs> I don't like mocking either. But that's just my personal, biased personal opinion. And mocking is pretty much uh, a necessary evil for any sort of moderately complex uh, integration test. Unless you dependency inject. Yeah, but my, my, my problem is when mock tests fail, I usually spend more time understanding what the mocking libraries do rather than what the problem was, because it's not uh, as readable as Python or Java or whatever. So it's like kind of a extra burden. It's because the mocking implementation sucks, not because the, the, the approach sucks. And, and yeah, the, exactly. And, approach and, and implementation is terrible. We try what we can. <laughs> and not just mocking, I, I mean test doubles in general, whatever they are, fakes, mocks, stubs, all of this. All right, it looks like the meeting's done. Um, we got to that important integration versus unit test. Uh, um, yeah. So, the testing framework for our testing framework. On its next step, quarter <laughs> two roadmap testing group. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for your time. And thank thanks you, everyone. again to the release testing thank team. I think you all did a fantastic job. Super impressive. Yes, great. Thanks. Thank you. Good job. Thank you.